All right. Okay, welcome to all students in Environment 460 and 495. Also, those of you watching on Zoom and YouTube. I am Gary Hamwork, and along with Eli Wheat, seated up towards the front, have been coordinating this fall speaker series around the topic of emotional resilience, finding hope in a time of ecological grief and planetary anxiety. I want to, before I begin and get farther, two announcements in particular for POE students holding up here, scholarships. There are scholarships you can apply for in the program. The announcement went out today. Um, and so if you want to see this, uh, you can grab it from me at the end or we can pass it around. That's a good idea to pass it around. Second announcement. Next week, the 495 students are going to be meeting with me. Please let me know whether you can meet here or whether you want to do it on Zoom. Okay, I can do either one. And a reminder next week, uh, this wouldn't print out for me, but there is that session you can sign up for an event hosted by the graduate school on rap in an age of climate chaos. So, you know, we can move from video gaming to rap and just kind of keep the things going. I'm going to begin with the tribal land acknowledgements. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot Nation. This acknowledgement is, I hope, a reminder for all of us in this setting, talking about the issues we're discussing, of the profoundly differential impacts of climate change and other environmental issues across varied societies and social groups. I'll let it check is Associate Professor of Film and Media Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She researches and teaches in the areas of environmental media, game studies, histories and theories of the digital, science and technology studies, and sound studies. She is the author of Playing Nature, Ecology in Video Games. Let's hold that up so people can see it, okay. <laughs> A thoughtful account of the world of environmental video games that is Quite frankly, a lot of fun to read. Um, I don't know how she got away with that, publishing at an academic press, but somehow. <laughs> and finally, in the interest of academic integrity with regard to my own students, no, I haven't completely finished it yet, but I will, and you can borrow my copy when I'm done. Melinda, <laughs> it's all yours. All right, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Lim, you must be tired after you know going to another talk, so I'll try to just talk more informally and not just read at you. Um, and thanks to Gary and to Eli. Um, I think the topic of this class is really great. Um, I give a lot of talks uh, to audiences around the world, but I think we all, anybody who works in this area of environmental studies or environmental humanities, which is more what I do, um, I think has had to wrestle with this, this issue of feeling depleted, um, feeling anxious, um, I'm a parent and I have feel this on behalf of my child. Um, so I, I was really happy to have this opportunity to kind of talk about my work, but then, you know, put it in relation to the stuff that you're also wrestling with. Um, all right, so let me start my slide presentation and uh, share screen, sorry. All right, and hide the big black boxes. Okay, just yell if there's something weird and you can't see something or whatever. Um, so I, I told Gary I was gonna just give a talk that is called Play For Us or Play For Yourselves and Play For The Planet. Um, and I'll explain sort of what that means, I hope through um, discussing my work and then we'll have a chance for questions um, and discussion at the end. And um, I will say that here at UC Santa Barbara, I am part of this, um, Environmental Justice, Climate Justice Research Hub, which is part of our Orfila Center for Global and International Studies. Um, and, you know, I think within the humanities, it's often um, very difficult to say that, you know, you're doing very direct environmental justice work, but that this hub has been one way for me to connect with my colleagues that are in many different disciplines around campus and to feel like I'm having a more direct impact. And I think um, a lot of the stuff that I've been doing since my book came out is also giving me that satisfaction of, of feeling like, um, you know, I'm, I'm moving the scholarship out of the academy, <laughs> okay? 
Um, okay, so I have a couple goals, right? Just a couple things, because it's it's not that long and I wanna respect our time. Um, I wanna talk kind of in the first part about why I think we shouldn't ignore games. Um, and by this, I mean digital games, but we could talk about board games, card games, LARPing, which is live action role-playing, anything really that's playful, but why we shouldn't ignore these particular kinds of interactive media forms um, when we're trying to, to understand and think about environmental thought and representation and, and reactions, right? And then um, I'm gonna shift at some point and talk more directly about why I think it's still important to cultivate play and to be playful and to have fun and enjoy games, even in the face of climate disruption, um, which can seem kind of counterintuitive when you're faced with the scale of, of the problems that we have. So Gary kindly kind of showed the book. This is the cover a little more closely. Um, this is my fun, like not really quiz, but does anybody recognize the images on the cover? Does anybody know what the games are? <laughs> not sure I could hear you if you responded, but. Um, no response here. Yeah, no <laughs> response. All right, I'll let, you, I'll let it hang for a while, but I will tell you by the end. <laughs> Um, okay, so in this book, I'm just gonna give you the snapshot, right? Um, I was really, uh, I was a former English professor, even though I'm a film and media professor, I was really thinking about uh, game content and sort of everything from narrative to game mechanics, which you know is sort of the procedural rules that operate within games. And I was really interested in their ability um, to dramatize environmental consequences, right? And so I was um, kind of marrying my love for science and technology studies with my love for media studies and for literary studies and thinking about um, what I think is a pretty fundamental similarity between playing games and designing scientific experiments or thinking scientifically about the world. Um, and a lot of it is about figuring out a particular system and how it works and um, the consequences within that system, which I think um, lends games, or at least many genres of games, not all games, right? But to thinking about ecological uh, principles, right? So I use terms from the scientific literature and from science more generally, like mesocosms, um, scale, entropy, collapse, and edge effects to really look at games and think about what they can do um, to help us uh, not necessarily, you know, go out and become activists, which is maybe the, the goal of some games, but um, more obliquely, or maybe, or more implicitly to think about what kinds of human environment relations are being um, kind of, you know, touted or promoted within games or, or vilified within games, right? And the argument here is just that games are really in some sense, at least when I started writing, maybe 10 plus years ago, that they were really a neglected medium within environmental criticism, which largely in its first few waves happened around like um, nature writing, right? Like literature and poetry. Um, and they're this really, they end up being this really amazing barometer of culture, um, of environmental knowledge and attitudes. So um, there's a theorist, Alexander Galloway, who wrote a book about gaming and in it, he said, because games are considered lowbrow, kind of popular culture, they're not really considered art, or at least at the time of his writing this, um, he said, you can see in them a, a type of beautifully undisturbed processing of contemporary life, right? So this is one of the things that I think made this um, book a real pleasure to research and to write. So we could talk more about this, um, but then, most of this book is thinking about, you know, games from the point of the view, point of view of the player and thinking about what's happening inside the games or these game worlds. But there are parts of it that actually kind of expand outward to think about the game industry and um, the environmental context of game production and disposal, and um, particularly in the entropy and collapse chapters. Um, and this work is kind of where I've been taking it since the book came out like three years ago. Um, so just for example, some of the stuff that I've been um, presenting on recently is actually looking at more conventional forms of athletic play like sports, right, um, as a way of demonstrating the inseparability of climate and, and games, right, um, and I'm kind of using this 
thermodynamic approach or maybe an atmospheric approach to games and thinking about heat and energy. Um, and so one of the case studies is of course winter sports, right? With climate change, this would be a sort of obvious example, but you know, things like the winter Olympic games, right? Researchers have, have already identified that within just a couple of decades, the most common host cities, right? Or host countries in this case for the winter games will not no longer um, be able to reliably host the games, right? And it, it does, it, it kind of does all these really interesting things to our notions of fairness um, of a level playing field and, and so on. And I thought this is, this is really interesting. We could talk about golf and sea level rise. We could talk about soccer. <laughs> um, the FIFA World Cup is happening and um, of all places, Cotter. And they had to move the international final from the summer months to the winter months because of the typical temperatures in that region. Um, there's an air conditioned outdoor stadium. And so, you know, I think we, there's just a lot to talk about with that. Um, and on this infrastructural side, I've also recently just finished a thing about cloud gaming, which you may have heard of with the um, rise and fall of Google Stadia. But, um, you know, cloud gaming is this kind of idea that rather than having a black box in your living room that you're playing off of, that you're, you're basically streaming games from the cloud. And so, you know, this is actually not that novel if you think about, you know, Netflix and and um, all these other services that we're already accustomed to um, using within from the cloud, right? Rather than owning the DVD, right? We just stream it. But gaming is kind of late to this and, and is kind of advertising this as the future of games and, and very convenient for players. And so in this research, um, which I completed with um, Jeff Watson at USC, you know, we were really trying to push back against this narrative that um, cloud gaming is liberatory and is going to like free players from physical constraints and, and, um, and all that stuff. And instead kind of argue that it's actually a doubling down on resource use, energy use, um, and really kind of concealing the physical and material realities on which our daily media use depends, right? So again, if we, if we wanna talk about this more and questions, happy to do that. Um, and so this work is kind of, I've been framing it in terms of the microclimates and the macroclimates of play. So you can think everything from the scale of the typical, you know, the proverbial man cave in a house, um, all the way up to global warming, right? So um, what I'm trying to argue is that our tendency to apply these tech solutions to overheating in domestic space or um, you know, in this case, inside a case, right, in case space, through things like fans, air conditioning, liquid cooling, right, which is what you see here with the tubes, um, that this kind of thinking and attitude really mimics in microcosm the, the sort of fascination that we have with geoengineering fixes to climate change, right? So these kind of science fictional stories about orbital mirrors or cloud seeding or, you um, you know, genetically amplified carbon capture through modified species. So, um, so I guess what I would say is that this is all about looking um, like a proper media scholar, <laughs> looking at both the content, but also looking at the, the infrastructural context and the climatic context. So this all the way from like the content of games, the narratives, the stories, the mechanics, um, over to the sustainability or lack of sustainability within the game industry and our consumption of these games. Um, so given all of this, right, and the urgency of the climate crisis, uh, I have sort of found myself, I guess, increasingly been, been collaborating with more people outside of the academy, um, which is really um, gratifying, I think. So I've been, uh, since Playing Major came out, I've been working a lot more with uh, game industry workers um, and art curators and museum education professionals, um, artists who are designing and making um, virtual worlds and exhibits. And this is really, um, this has been really uh, satisfying. And so as one example of that, um, I've been, I haven't had time lately, but <laughs> I've been, um, I, for, I was one of the first members of this, um, climate special interest group of the International Game Developers Association, which is sort of the mm, kind of like a worldwide trade organization for game workers or game developers. It's not a union, but it's, it's sort of like a you know, trade org, right? 
Um, and they have a lot of different special interest groups based on various axes of affinity. But this is the climate special interest group was started by um, Paula Esquadra at Google and um, Hugo Billy, who is a game designer that used to work for Electronic Arts and made the games They Breathe and Faye. And, um, and so being involved with this has been great. And one of the things that we actually did was we released this kind of alpha version of the environmental game design playbook, which is really targeted um, at game designers or people who are making games to think about what is it that I can do when, I, when I'm creating a game um, to, to keep climate kind of at the center of my interests, right? Whether that's um, building it sustainably, <laughs> releasing and distributing it sustainably, or um, creating content and mechanics that, that dramatize these issues, right? And we've had a little bit of a loose alliance with a couple of groups like the Indicate um, sort of Festival of Independent Games, which is actually um, really tied to a Seattle-based group called Games for Our Future. And they've done things like climate game jams, which are great. Um, and also the UN. So the United Nations has an initiative that's called Playing for the Planet, which is kind of part of where I was taking the title of this presentation from. Um, but the Playing for the Planet Alliance is actually um, an alliance of game organizations that have basically pledged to maybe try to cut <coughs> their carbon footprint or to include more eco green content in their games, right? So it's not, it's not at the level of the player. Um, so this is just one example of this kind of more public facing work. Um, but all of this, you know, has also led me to be more interested in open access publishing. Um, and this kind of budding new field in, in academia, which is called environmental media studies. So I, um, I'll talk about this journal in a second, which I helped to start and is open access through University of California Press. Um, but environmental media studies is um, sort of a, like a variant of, of media studies where we really just explode the definition of what a medium is or what media are, right? So it's not just mass media or something that can you know, carry electrical signals or deal with symbols, right? But it's, it's this idea that um, media and environments really co-constitute each other and environments are media um, and media themselves are environments. Um, our bodies, our landscapes, our waterways are also media, right? So it's pretty, you know, it's right at the edge of making media unusable as a term, but we kind of like it that way. <laughs> I, I have wrote an entire piece about the idea of remediation, which is a, a really kind of common term within media studies about how media um, kind of take up aspects of other media, right? So an online newspaper, right? Or um, how streaming resembles television, but kind of also folding in this idea of environmental remediation to think about how do we um, make our media and our world better um, through the process of mediation. So, um, so yeah, so, <laughs> you know, I think I'm a professor, so I'm obviously, I'm always gonna stress that it's important to do research and it's important to kind of think and have scholarship and to teach and to, you know, find out more about all of these areas. But I think it's also important to um, open these, these talks out to the public, um, to climate skeptics, to um, people who are too busy working. <laughs> Right, and to also push for more open access and to resist the enclosure of the kinds of knowledge that we make in the academy and to make sure that as many people as possible have a seat at the table when we're talking about this stuff. So it's been really good, right, that um, we started this journal Media and Environment, um, which is at mediaenviron.org. And um, this is kind of an old splash page, but you can go and see that we, we do it kind of by what we call streams or special issues. and. The most recent one is actually um, a stream about energy justice and global perspective. And we had another one about modeling the Pacific Ocean. And this journal is, is definitely a voice for academics, but it's also um, a place for artists, a place for activists, filmmakers, and, and so on to really come together and to talk about these things and to also make kind of multimodal scholarship that's not just words, right, but also photographs and um, data visualizations and podcasts and all that other kind of stuff. Okay. All right. Stop me if there's anything you want to interject, but um, I want to kind of switch over to the 
second part, which is more engaged with your class, right, on, on um, eco-anxiety and, and uh, emotions, right? And um, I guess the question is, is it enough to just look at video games, <laughs> uh, the ecology of video games, which I did, or the sustainability of the game industry, or even, you know, to think about environmental justice in relation to games, right? So um, like what I was talking about earlier, there are all these things like pollution and power outages, wildfires, heat waves, sea level rise that are going to impact, you know, all the forms of clay that we're accustomed to having access to, but the sort of risk and vulnerability is going to be distributed disproportionately, right? So remember I talked about the Olympic games, but there's also an Arctic winter games that is traditionally held by First Nations peoples um, around the Arctic circle and, you know, they're going to be facing greater disruption even than, than others, right? Um, so that, that's a start, right? But I'm sure there are at least some of you who are in the audience who are saying, you know, given that the game industry um, has this really outsized impact uh, in terms of its, you know, production of all these devices and consumption, right? Gaming computers are way more energy intensive than your average computer. I think there was a, a Lawrence Berkeley National Lab study saying that a souped up gaming PC consumes around as much energy as three Energy Star refrigerators, right? Um, so if we know all of this, um, and this is a, a picture of the famous um, Alamogordo landfill excavation where Atari dumped thousands of unused cartridges of this notoriously terrible game, E.T., um, in this landfill, and then later they dug it up to try to, try to uh, monetize it. But if we know all of this, right, um, shouldn't we just refuse to play or refuse to game or maybe donate or throw away our PlayStations or whatever it is that you play on? And this, this really resembles a lot of the rhetoric around digi digital detoxing, right? Like, let's just get off Twitter. Let's get off social media. Let's, um, you know, do a, uh, you know, like a device-free weekend or whatever it is. And I totally get that. Um, there's some merit in that. And I've wrestled with all of these kinds of these questions, but rather than try to resolve it or just recommend, yeah, that's what you should do. I actually try to keep the tension alive because I think that's more, um, it's more helpful, right? It's to, to think about the potentials and the possibilities of media on the one hand, as well as their inevitable negative impacts, right? So we need to actually keep both alive and in play. And um, so part of it is just that I think there's a danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater here. So just acknowledging that media are always going to be double-edged in this way um, and that the solution isn't necessarily to withdraw, right? From using them or totally abstain, right? Um, and I should footnote this by saying that refusal is a powerful political move and a personal move, right? Um, but to go back to that Galloway quote from earlier, um, I love that games and other you know, forms of media are these windows into our current environmental crisis and I wouldn't wanna give that up, right? And then from the standpoint of emotions, I do think that um, all this research that happens around games and play is actually really helpful to people who are in environmental studies or in policy or um, the sciences who are kind of facing this, this tidal wave of crisis and, and despairing, right? And so it's a reminder to actually, um, it's a reminder of the importance of joy, right? And of, of having the ability to imagine near-term and not just long-term futures that are sustainable. Um, we could talk about resiliency, community building, or just even having the, the energy, the wherewithal to disrupt the status quo, right? And I think play is, is a necessary part of that. Um, so let me just put it a totally different way, be a little more crass, right? Which is we could just say, why, why continue to play, right? When the world is on fire. And, um, you know, when I talk to some people, I think the cynical answer comes to mind to that question. And it's because we're doomed anyway, we might as well enjoy ourselves, right? While we can. And this is, this is actually, this, there's a name for this. Um, if you've read Ministry for the Future, um, I think Kim Stanley Robinson talks about it in somewhere in there when he's talking about different kind of pathological responses to environmental crisis. 
And the classic response is avoidance, right? I don't want to think about it. Um, and, um, you know, researchers call this the mask of the red death syndrome. And it's named for the Edgar Allan Poe short story where, um, you know, these nobles are, are kind of throwing a lavish masquerade, um, even though they know that outside the walls, right, of, the, of their masquerade, there's an encroaching plague, right, that's decimating the countryside. And so in a way, um, you know, I'm playing devil's advocate, I guess, in some way, but play in light of all these known environmental and social costs, right, of electronics, supply chains, and so on, uh, energy consumption, it can feel like reckless indulgence. And I, I totally understand that. And I would acknowledge that a lot of forms of play are very privileged, but in the time remaining, right, I wanna emphasize three aspects of play that I do think make it, um, a vital and, and important aspect of our response to environmental crisis. So one is that um, playing makes us vulnerable or it, it, it's in some way fundamentally about vulnerability. And I know, we, you know in the Q&A we could talk about toxic masculinity and Gamergate and lots of other stuff. There are plenty of circles of communities of play where, where this is not necessarily the case. But, um, and this is a, like an image from one of my son's favorite um, storybooks when he was younger from Elephant and Piggy. Um, and so before I talk about that, I think the usual narrative about games is that they're, they're about mastery, right? Like you play a game because you feel the satisfaction of mastering something and being able to dominate something, which is usually either the environment of the game or other players, right? Um, but I think if you're somebody who does play and you may, may or may not identify as a gamer, right? Um, but you still might play board games with your family or, or card games or mobile games. Um, so if you play, I think it's actually pretty clear that play is about embracing a shared condition of vulnerability. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, you're vulnerable to chance, you're vulnerable to other players' decisions, um, or like I was talking about earlier, you're vulnerable to the weather conditions on any given day. And, um, the flip side to that vulnerability is really the potential for community or camaraderie that comes with being vulnerable together, right? So some of my closest friends are people that I've been playing with for years, if not decades, right? <clears throat> and so in this book, um, oh, I forgot the name actually, <laughs> but <laughs> um, Elephant and Piggy are trying to find a way to play with the snake, even though he doesn't have hands, right, or feet to throw or kick a ball. And they kind of experience a shared sense of, of confusion and vulnerability, but they find a way to kind of solve this issue. Um, we could even, you know, as an, I, unfortunately, I don't have time to really kind of do a deep dive into a game and, and talk about it, but I was gonna say um, for like a, a chunk of earlier this year or last year, I was totally obsessed with cozy games, which is a, like a weird new genre. Um, and so in some ways, there are all these genres that are becoming popular that are really kind of coping mechanisms, right? Um, uh, like Cozy Grove, um, which um, is where you, you play as like a, a spirit scout who gets sent to an island infested with um, spirit bears. And you have to kind of put it to rights, which involves also restoring the environment. And this has to do with Sarah, Sarah Ray's um, she has this excellent book. I'm sure you've talked about it already, <laughs> A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety. Um, but in it, she has this, uh, this diagram about the, the affective arc or the emotional arc of the standard environmental studies curriculum. And so it's, sorry, it's an ugly slide, but you can see here, you kind of start in this place of idealism. You lose your innocence as you learn more about things and then you feel guilty or shamed. Um, and you kind of reach this nadir, this low point of nihilism, out of which, you know, in order to kind of come back out of that, you need to have a, what she calls the bake cookies phase. Um, I would say it's also the play games phase, right? Where you have self-care and you rediscover pleasure and community. And then hopefully that leads to hope, efficacy and resilience. Um, and so this is, I see games as maybe being part of that um, right there with the cookies. Um, a second thing is, right, that playing uh, despite everything your parents have told you, is actually very hard work, right? 
Um, so, you know, playing requires, like actual playing requires a lot of effort. Um, and, um, you know, one of my, one of my favorite lines about play is actually from a botanist, um, an indigenous, part indigenous botanist, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who wrote Braiding Seagrass and Gathering Moss. Um, and in Braiding Sweetgrass, um, she's talking about kind of playing outdoors and playing in the mud, but she says, um, I've never outgrown my desire to play in the mud, right? Isn't play the way we get limbered up for the work of the world? And I think that's, I've always loved this quote, right? Because um, not only is it talking about finding inspiration in, in nature and its relationships and rhythms, but she's also holding up these things like our capacities for joy and gratitude and even just being silly, right? Against the otherwise crushing effects of, of you know, settler colonialism and capitalism. And in particular, if she's holding up not both scientific ways of knowing as well as indigenous ways of knowing as very differently, but equally potent, right? Um, and then the last is, um, you know, that play um, is certainly not limited to young people, but that it is very bound up with young people and reminds us maybe of their power. And so, um, you know, uh, Greta Thunberg's obviously a lot older now, but these images um, when she was 15 and skipping school to protest in front of the Swedish parliament have stuck with a lot of people, including me. Um, and, you know, a lot of young people, not just Thunberg, have had, um, have mobilized in, you know, Sunrise Movement, Fridays for Future, um, and have really showed a, a really um, important vitality. And part of what makes them so powerful and so striking, I think, is that, um, is that they refuse in some ways to play, right? Um, so this is definitely Greta Thunberg's angle, right? Is um, chastening adults, right? Uh, because of what ad adults have not done, right? That she cannot afford to be a normal kid. Um, then adults who should know better are ignoring the realities of climate change. And this definitely does, I mean, it is very powerful. It has a very forceful impact, but it also leaves me very, um, grim and sort of depressed, right? Um, and so what I try to think about in this is also that to me, even Greta Thunberg's activism is, is very playful. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of room for play within activism as well as outside of it, right? So, I mean, it's what's more playful than skipping school? Um, or choosing to sail across the Atlantic instead of flying, right? Um, or to thumb your nose at grownups. Um, or even, you know, I'm thinking of um, more recently the Just Stop Oil throwing soup on famous paintings, right? What's more playful than a food fight in that sense? Okay. All right. So I'm just going to wrap up. Um, this is a screenshot from Alba, a wildlife adventure made by Us Two Games. Us Two is much more known for Monument Valley. Um, those series of, of games on, on phones, but this is a very charming one. And there's actually a moment in the game where you're, you know, on this kind of Mediterranean island with your friend Inez and, um, and somebody, a really awful adult is asking you, do you seriously think someone like you can make a difference? And you have to like use your mouse to actually nod or shake your head, right? Um, so the whole point of this, I'm just trying to make is just that games our great window into the world, right? They're not peripheral to the, to the world and its fate, right? In the realm of escapism, but they're actually um, really important bellwethers of, of um, kind of where we're at and where we're going, okay? And um, I think at the same time, if there's some value in, in thinking about climate disruption through games, because it reminds us of like the essential parts of the game experience or the play experience, which is being vulnerable, being at risk, um, and also essential to coalition building, right? So if there's some way we can leverage that, right, that would be really powerful. So hence, right, play for yourselves, right? To, to help yourselves, but also to, to help each other and to help the planet. And I think I will just you know, stop there. And this is, feel free to get in touch. Sharing if I can find my mouse. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Elena. Um, 
Uh, we have, in my experience, a very inquisitive and curious group of students here who are typically filled with questions. I'm hoping they brought some really hard ones for you today. Uh, <laughs> a reminder for all of them, when you're saying your question, try to speak to the owl and project a little bit, right? The people at home can hear you as well. I have 10 questions. I'm not going to go first. Oh, somebody also guessed one of the games. Yay, you're right. It's Firewatch. And the other one was Walden, which is a, a video game that some people have called the most improbable video game of all time because it's a video game version of Thoreau's Walden uh, that was made out of USC. <laughs> I figured that out by cheating. I looked at the back cover of your book. <laughs> Where the illustrations come from. We could talk about cheating and gaming in relation to each other, but I won't. That too, yeah. From the back, yeah. Yeah, I had a question about the intersection of like virtual, virtual world and like preservation. Like I was just kind of thinking about what if like, you know, we're having a changing climate and we create in these virtual game space what the climate is now. And in like years to come, and our climate changes, and then we have these virtual spaces where people can visit what was once was. Mm. Um, I just was like curious, like, is there is that even like a field? Is there even this virtual kind of like idea? Like, does conservation in the virtual world like connect yet, or do you see it connecting? Yeah. Uh, thanks. I didn't didn't get your name. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, my name's Sam. Sam, okay, thanks. I think I see you on the owl. It's small, but that's great. Um, it's a good question to think about games in relation to conservation. And it makes me think of um, Richard Powers's novel, the super thick novel, The Overstory, which a lot of people were just like super excited about because it's about trees. And But there's a character in that book that is um, like uh, the son of Indian immigrants that goes to Stanford and then has like a freak fall from a tree and is, is paralyzed, but then becomes the kind of CEO of a game, Silicon Valley game company and creates the super, super um, addictive and immersive virtual world, right? That is richly realized, um, kind of like the metaverse, but metaverse is way worse, <laughs> right? And it's kind of put out there, I feel like in a non-ironic way as like a thing to celebrate, like a way to a way to connect, um, but but I think I think there are better ways to maybe align games with conservation than going the sort of metaverse route, right? Um, I'm really interested in that thing that you mentioned, which is like, is this going to potentially be a way for us to visit what no longer exists? Um, that that has happened already within games, and I think um, I'm sort of. My next book might actually be about digital modeling and how, how we kind of uh, put all this energy into modeling things, um, but particularly like plants and other kinds of natural form, life forms. Um, and there's this company called Speedtree, which um, is based in South Carolina. and was started by a bunch of um, Department of Defense contractors. And um, they're now the leading kind of digital vegetation modelers, right? And then not just for games. So they're, if you've played any blockbuster or AAA game, you've probably seen speed trees in those games, but speed trees are also present in um, television and films and um, architectural visualizations. And so if you've seen uh, James Cameron's avatar, right? The, you know, when you're the opening scene where you're kind of swooping into the Pandoran rainforest, those are speed trees, right? Um, or if you've seen Game of Thrones, right? The, what is it? The white, you know, like the Northern forest, right? All that kind of stuff. Like increasingly, like we're, what we're seeing is actually computer generated vegetation, right? And so because I'm a nerd and I'm interested in this stuff, I'm really interested to know like, are these like botanically accurate trees? Does that matter? Um, you know, you could argue that it doesn't really matter, right? But uh, I think it does. Um, and we're definitely at this point where we may have digital models of, of things that we that no longer exist, right? Um, like a giant sequoia or 
Um, I know you just came from a talk on cannabis. Speed Tree also has sells digital models for cannabis, Sativa. So you can buy Speed Weed. It sometimes goes on sale for 420. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's just really hilarious. Um, it's, it's both sad and hilarious that we have this, this kind of industry. Um, and I'm really interested in, um, like I want to get a grant and do some workshops where I go into communities and teach them the skills to do modeling of, of like their local environment and species and things that are important to them. I do this, I did this in a class and um, you know, what are, what are models that you don't find that don't exist already or who that are done really badly? And I've had students do things that are very culturally and naturally specific. So modeling like um, cactus paddles, like Nopalis that you would eat, um, feminine hygiene products, um, uh, like traditional instruments, uh, all this kind of stuff. I think, I think there's a lot to be done. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that answered the question. There's, we could talk about other ways to conserve or. Next. One thing I should point out is the time change means it's dark here already. We're in the middle of night, so. I'm here, I know. In our mode, I think. I could also mention Firewatch, one of the games that's on the cover is actually, um, it, at the time, it was made by a really small San Francisco studio called Campo Santo, and it's it takes place. The idea is that it takes place in the Shoshone National National Forest, right in Wyoming, and um, so people really praised the game for the the environmental realism. Um, I don't have the screenshots right here to share, but um, so this is a game that was really. Um, got a lot of awards for its environmental artistry. And I think it is amazing. It's really, it's beautiful. But even, you know, even within this game, there are a lot of environmental shortcuts. Um, so even though there are, you know, 14,000 individual tree placements in that game, there are only, I think like 12 or 13 actual tree models in that game that are, are trying to be realistic. But um, once you know that, it's really hard to play and, to and sort of, feel immersed, right? It kind of takes you out of your immersion. Because if you look around, like you look off the trail, you'll see like literally identical trees <laughs> with the same like broken branch, right? Um, like four of them, like within within your view. And it just, I, I, you know, this is the kind of thing that I think is interesting about games and can make us think about how we approach our own environments with the same kind of plant blindness or even, you know, species blindness, right? You know, go ahead. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I know Gary has 10 questions, but I have I have only one. <laughs> actually, that's not true at all. I have actually three, but I want to ask my favorite one, which is that um you just said toward the end of your talk, you said games can kind of be a bellwether, right? That means they like, can kind of tell us where we are and right now. And I think that's cool. But I don't think that that's as cool as what I want them to be able to do, right? Like mm -hmm. what I want games to be able to do is move the needle on where we mm -hmm. are. Right now. So mm -hmm. I just wonder if that's anything you've sort of thought about or if you, I mean, maybe there are games that are doing that. I guess, you know, Star Trek moved the needle. I just saw somebody today with a head thing and it's like walking around talking to somebody like- Right. Ship, right? So, I mean, maybe, right. maybe that, it, maybe it already happens, but I yeah. don't know. Like, yeah. I mean, I get it. And I think I've had scientists approach me and, you know, um, you know, like they're interested in games, but they don't, they literally don't want to commit a single second of their time unless it can be demonstrably, <laughs> like you're saying, like it's going to demonstrate an impact. Right. And, and, um, you know, I've been in conferences with, um, you know, Google AI people and, and like uh, people at world conservation organizations and stuff. And they're all interested in the sort of power of games to maybe communicate a message or whatever. But the typical stuff that they produce is really, um, uh, just doesn't really end up being super effective. And I think there's, a, there's like a, a disconnect between um, like how, how people want to use games, right? And maybe what actually makes games successful, 
right? And so I, I don't know, there's, there's a really, there's a huge area of serious games. I actually just did a review of a game that was being built um, with a National Science Foundation grant out of UC Santa Cruz and it's called um, Warmer. Um, I can link the link, but it's a game that is explicitly trying to teach about climate change through these different um, sort of modules, right? One takes place like just more about policy, um, you know, where you're kind of trying to decide between different policies and legislation. Um, one takes place in the forest where you're fighting fires, um, et cetera. Uh, sorry, I thought it was warmer, ucsc.edu, but I, I'll have to find it, sorry. <laughs> um, but a lot of these games I just get, you know, it's hard because it only reaches a, such a small audience. And in some ways, I think these really AAA blockbuster games that millions of people rush out to buy as soon as they come out end up maybe having more of an impact, right? Like Red Dead Redemption or something like that, you know, that has this lovingly realized Western environment. Um, and like, sometimes I'm like super skeptical even about the, like I'm a huge proselytizer for games and game studies, but I myself am skeptical sometimes. But then I'll read things like um, back when um, Farmville was really popular on Zynga, it was like a, it was the game that made um, Facebook successful. It was like a farming game, right? That they stole from uh, a Chinese company, the kind of idea of it. Um, and, you know, millions of people were playing that game and people, even though it was such a silly game and didn't, was not environmentally realistic at all, there were people that would say, well, I walk outside after playing Farmville and I, and I see the world differently, <laughs> right? So it's really, it's interesting that you can achieve those effects even with something very simple. Um, and I could- I feel about that. Whenever I go out to the field and come back inside, I feel like I- Yeah, the, like I, well, so I have other like talks that I give to designers where I try to push them to um, incorporate more of these principles and to also push players to to not necessarily just play inside right there's a lot oh, there are a lot of other things that we could talk about um, but I think you know one of some of my students at the Bren School of Environmental Science that I had advised they wanted to make a game to teach younger people about environmental science and so they ended up um, you know coming up with this idea of an outdoor escape room which I thought was fabulous and they started a company and they were running events at the Botanic Garden and at the Museum of Natural History. And it sounds so like not logical because escape rooms are all about being locked in a room, right? Like some obscure strip mall room, right? You have to get out. Um, but, you know, the, by using sheeting and tents and caution tape and all this other stuff, they kind of invented a new genre, which I thought was brilliant. Right. Cool. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned how like there's you know big blockbuster games that get a lot of attention how are there ways in which like I know me personally I'm not super into gaming but I struggle to find like those niche games or is there kind of a way that we can better advertise games that maybe like an environmental message rather than sort of like the default of like your FIFA games or your Call of Duty that sort of thing yeah I think that's a really good question because I do think um, um, there are, you'd be, I think you would be shocked actually at the kind of variety of games that exist out there. I kind of started my writing when I was introduced to this game called Flower um, by a friend who was just like, oh, I, I kind of use this to like meditate and to unwind, right? You should check it out. <laughs> and it was made by these USC grads and it was part of a kind of three game deal with Sony they're based in Santa Monica um, and they're now super successful and famous. They also made um, Flow and um, what is it? I think um, Journey and, um, and then Cloud, I think. I'm forgetting the last one or Sky, sorry, Sky. Um, but, you know, I was like blown away that something like this existed where you're just literally, you actually play as sort of the wind and you're just kind of soaring over these um, Southern Californian landscapes and you're you're kind of revitalizing the landscape um, and it has haptic controls. Um, so there are actually a lot of examples and I think getting the word out 
unless you know somebody like me, it's really hard, right? <laughs> right. Or, you know, I have a lot of parent friends who come to me and they're just like, can you recommend things that I can actually have my kid play, right? Um, I think there are, there's more interest now, right? There's like, uh, there are more people who are kind of blogging about it and we're sh- podcasting about it and sharing these suggestions. Um, but it is difficult because it's still kind of considered a niche and it's also considered like serious games, right? Like this is a game that has to teach you something. It's going to edify you. And that turns off a lot of people right away, right? Right, writing a novel with a message is probably a great way to write an unsuccessful novel. (laughs) Right, right. I mean, it goes back to the whole, like the facts are out there, they've been out there for a long time and that doesn't necessarily change people's minds, right? I mean, I wanna pull you back, because nobody raised their hand, to the question of emotion. Um, You play games a fair amount. Um, You write about people who play them and you talk about it. How would you describe the emotional space that you think you're in when you're playing a game, a video game? Yeah. Um, I think that actually it kind of brings me back to the mastery thing, um, mm-hmm. where the kind of the typical understanding of games is that it's about control and mastery, right? And um, that people are, you know, we're attracted to games as systems because of that, but it's not the only thing, right? But, um, you know, in some ways it, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you're trying to think about climate crisis, right? There is no planet B to, to go to a medium where you have infinite replay, right? Um, multiple lives, right? But then for that, for that narrative, there's always a counter narrative, right? There are games that are, uh, that are, uh, there's a genre of permadeath games where you either play, you impose on yourself the restriction that there's only one life, or only one world, or there are permadeath modes like in Minecraft, for instance, where if you screw up uh, in Minecraft, you know, that world gets wiped. It's no longer available to you, right? And it's kind of instructive. Um, And um, I kind of borrow a page here from queer game studies because there's a lot of interest in how we can design and kind of play against the grain of, of normal games to play differently and to think differently and to kind of resist the status quo. So, you know, like instead of like in Burnout Paradise, it's just like a racing game where you're just trying to cause maximum havoc (laughs) and create the fire, most fiery explosions, right? Like a way to play it queerly or kind of against the grain is to, you know, drive really carefully. <laughs> and to, you know, and to you know, really embrace a different a different mode or resist to the sort of normative progression of a lot of games. Um, and I think the, we could say the same thing about environmental, maybe environmental gaming, and to kind of cultivate an emotional palette that is that is not about mastery or control, but is actually about you know vulnerability or grief. There's um, there are games that kind of explore ego grief and, and, and loss, um, or that even allow you to play as non-human characters and um, like the shelter games. I think I talk about them in chapter three or something, <laughs> but there's a Swedish studio that makes these games where you play as like a mother badger and you have to take care of your badger babies or your mother lynx. And your job is basically to keep them alive until the end of the game. And it's actually really hard. And so you can find Let's Plays online about all these people who are playing the game and then they're like totally horrified and aghast, right? When one of their babies gets snatched by like a winged predator (laughs) or or perishes in the flood or dies of starvation because you didn't do a good job of finding food, right? Um, So it's a little, it's a little hard to discuss, but you know, people have thought about empathy through games and kind of also debunked that, but I think there is maybe, there is still something there that is of interest or maybe of value. We're at 5.30 and I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Um, So thank you very much for coming and talking with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. And tell us what game we should go home and play. (laughs) Oh boy. Oh, um, Stray, if you haven't played it.
um, is a game, recommendation from an a game where you play as a kid, as a cat in a post-apocalyptic underground city. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm such a cat person. <laughs> <laughs>